Welcome back to Hello Nigeria. Our first guest is with us in the studio, and we're going to be looking at female genital mutilation. Now, this is a conversation we need to have in Nigeria because the female genital mutilation cases in Nigeria account for the highest in the world. Now, lots of women between the ages of 27 and 35 would experience, or most of them have experienced, female gen genital mutilation, and we need to put an end to this. Now, not only is it a fundamental infringement of their human rights, it's also not safe. We'll be looking at the intrigue cases of this with an someone who is an expert and advocate. She's a medical practitioner, a health contributor to The Guardian magazine. Her name is Dr. Nesochi Iwokwe Okeke, and this is not her first time, but we're always delighted to have her here on Hello Nigeria. Thank you so much for joining us. Thanks for having me again. All right, okay. so let's go straight into the conversation. Yes. We're looking at uh, female genital mutilation. Now, we know that female genital mutilation is something that is born out of our culture and our tradition because they used to do it in the time past. But we understand that not every of our cultural practices should still be kept in 2018. And okay. female genital mutilation is one we are still on, held on to. But some people don't understand just how prevalent it is. So tell us, from your experience, how prevalent really is it in Nigeria? It's still really very much so prevalent. I actually recently did a radio interview on the topic, and we had callers you know, calling in, basically stating that they saw no problem with it, that the reason that it's done is to make the girls less promiscuous and get them ready for their husbands in the future. So it's still a prevailing thought process, even in those um, communities whereby people may have been educated, but they're still holding on to those traditional beliefs. Wow. Okay. And... Let's even break it down for those who don't understand what female genital mutilation is. I always describe it as the um, opposite of circumcision, but I don't know if that's a, a valid definition, you know, because I feel like it's just cutting off a woman's organs as well. So why is it done, really? What is it and why is it done? So let's break it down. What exactly is female genital mutilation? Some people also call it female circumcision, but it's essentially a practice uh, without any actual medical or therapeutic basis in which the female external genitalia is removed. And it's usually done in an unsanitary environment with an unsanitary sharp object, like a razor blade or a knife or a glass. And the World Health Organization has actually classified um, different types and subcategories of female genital mutilation. So there are four subtypes, and I'll go into that. The first um, type is type 1. And that's when just the clitoris or part of it is cut off. That's type 1 female genital mutilation. Type 2 female genital mutilation is when the clitoris and part of the labia minora or all the labia minora is cut off. And then we have type 3 female genital mutilation. Now, this is more, the, more of the severe, the more, one of the most severe forms of um, female genital mutilation. And with this kind, what they do is actually cut off most of the external genitalia, including the clitoris, and then they sew together what's remaining, leaving only a little hole for urination. And the idea is when the young girl has now found her husband in the future, they'll now remove those sutures again in the barbaric fashion that they put it together so that she would be now ready for her husband. So those are three types. And then the last type is type 4 female genital mutilation. And this categorization is basically an unspecified subcategory. Basically, anything else that was not covered in type 1, 2, or 3 that can still cause harm to the female genital organs. OK, so this is really very, um, it's a lot to take in. Mm -hmm. And we, we still have practices like this. So basically, a lot of them is being done because of our culture and because people assume that when you do this, it helps the woman to be less promiscuous. Yes. But this, obviously, they're not, they don't have any medical backings or any backing whatsoever. So what, what basically is the way out of this? We know that is an infringement of the human rights of these girls. What basically is the way out of this? Well, the way out of this at this point is educating people and letting them know what the real harms of the practice are. Because here in Nigeria, there are actually um, legislation, there's actually legislation against this. The Violence Against Persons Acts, under that legislation, it states that it's a crime to even engage in this. But guess what? These things still happen, even though we do have these bills and these legislations, and we have all these human, or, uh, human rights organizations that let everyone know that this is wrong. But the thing is, how do we actually enforce it? 
The only way to enforce it is to make people more aware of the issue and basically change their thought process and their thinking to let them know why you should no longer hold on to this cultural or traditional practice. So uh, some people don't know, don't understand if they could go to jail for this, if it's a punishable crime or punishable offense. So can you explain what the stance of the law is with regards to this as well? Mm. So it is a punish punishable offense because it's a crime against a woman. It's a crime against a young girl. You are harming another human being. Let's just put it in perspective. Think about a young little girl between six to eight years of age who was pretty much held down against her will, not knowing what is going on, and they take some kind of object that is usually very dirty and just start cutting her genital organs. This is detrimental for, so, towards her life and her well-being in general. Okay, so I'm going to ask, I know that you've been involved in this and the awareness for this, but mm -hmm. I want to say, um, are there any particular areas, like regions where this has been prominent in? Because I remember I had experience of this in school in Cross River. Mm -hmm. There was a part that was known to be actually having this as their cultural beliefs. Mm -hmm. Is there any particular region in this country where this is known, you know, they know them for this? And what so are the ways? This happens actually across the board everywhere. Mm -hmm. And I'm not just talking about everywhere in Nigeria. There are cases even in the Western world, cases even in the United States of America where female genital mutilation is occurring still. Wow. So it would be unwise to believe that this is only a problem here in Nigeria or here on the African continent. It happens everywhere around the world, in Asia, in the US, everywhere. And so far since the whole awareness, has there been changes that you've seen in mm -hmm. some communities that this, you know, the education that has been given to them, have there been changes of beliefs and all of that? I think it's, it takes a few steps. It's little by little and it takes some time before you can actually change somebody's mind and their thought process. So when I discuss this, I think I try to let them know what the health implications really are because when they realize and understand not only the immediate but the long-term consequences, then it can kind of change someone's perspective to realize that this um, cultural or traditional practice is harmful, is wrong, and it's a violation of one's human rights. We don't have these conversations enough. I mean, the first time I came in contact with a conversation about this was a cartoon mm -hmm. when I was much younger at Sarah, for those of you who, who ever saw the cartoon Sarah. Mm -hmm. uh, but we don't see much of that anymore. So we need to keep the conversation going as much as, much as we can. We need to enlighten people, let them know the dangers of this. Every opportunity we have exactly. to have these conversations. All right, thank you so much for, for joining us. How can people follow you on social media? You can follow me on social media on Twitter at Dr. Nasochi, D-R-N-E-S-O-C-H-I. All right. Thank you so much for joining us. To enjoy more of these our Ugonke videos when you just watch, press this button to subscribe on top of our YouTube page. You go love her.